Today's store lecturer slash evolution ecology speaker is Jonathan Lozos. Um, Jonathan uh, was an undergraduate at Harvard where he early on fell under the influence of Ernest Williams and, uh, and was suitably inspired. Um, he then uh, went to graduate school at Berkeley with Harry Green and then he was in the first cohort of CPB, Center for Population Biology, postdocs with me. And then he got his first true employment at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, but it wasn't long before he got the call from Harvard. And he went to Harvard, and that's where he presently is, uh, the Monique and Philip Lehner Professor and Curator of, of Herpetology at the MCZ. And Jonathan's won so many honors. Um, is noted in so many ways that would take me half the seminar to, to go into this. So I'll just say one thing, and that is one of his most recent honors was to be elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And, um, and I thought I would tell you what he did by how we told them what he did. So let me just read a, a condensed version. Lozo synthesizes present day studies of ecological processes with, with historical studies of evolutionary outcomes to understand evolutionary diversification both by example with, with his quarter century long research program on anolis lizards and by influential review synthesis papers plus his highly regarded 2009 book. He is one of the foremost proponents of the experimental approach to studying evolutionary phenomena in nature. Lozos advocates the importance of a detailed understanding of organisms and their environmental interactions and undercurrent running throughout his book and resulting in the Edward O. Wilson Natural, Naturalist Award he has pioneered the application of phylogenetics slash historical approaches to a wide variety of topics in novel and creative ways. Early on, statistical approaches that uh, incorporate phylogenetic information, understanding patterns of convergence in community structure in a phylogenetic context, determining evolution's contribution to species area relationships, and showing what phylogenies reveal about the geography of speciation. He continues to be a preeminent contributor toward an integrative, balanced view concerning the role of phylogenetic slash historical approaches in understanding evolution. And uh, so he thinks great thoughts, and that proves it. But I just want to also sh um, show by example that he is, he's got his, he's, he's, he's definitely on the ground, um, you know, in the front line as far as field is concerned. And we have a little um, film loop showing uh, John sat in the rock here. That may know what he's doing. left in this. The rest of them have all been deleted. <laughs> Manuel Leal, uh, Duke University, one of our colleagues in research, did that. So without any more delay, Jonathan is going to talk about lizards in an evolutionary tree, ecology and adaptive radiation in the knolls. Well, I would thank you, Tom, for those very kind words. And th I thought I was going to catch the lizard. <laughs> How disappointing. Oops, hit the wrong thing. Okay, here we go. So, my topic today is adaptive radiation. And could we bring the lights down just a, a bit more? Many, most, if not all, of the classic cases of adaptive radiations come from islands. Examples such as the Darwin's finches on the Galapagos, the Hawaiian honey creepers, the Hawaiian silver swords, or in some cases, they come not from islands per se, but from lakes, which are very much the terrestrial equivalent of islands, so things like the cichlid fishes. In fact, the ubiquity of, of islands as, a, uh, as the cases of adaptive radiation, it's so pervasive that some people have made the claim that adaptive radiation only occurs on islands. Now, I'm not endorsing this view, but I think it does show you how strongly this is an island phenomenon. I'm sure some people in this room would disagree with this opinion, as in fact my, I might. 
Why is it, though, that adaptive radiation occurs so commonly on islands? And the, the reason behind this, the thought, is really very simple. It's what's been commonly called ecological opportunity, a phenomenon that we hear a lot about these days. And the idea is simply this. You get an island that, say, emerges out of the ocean, a volcanic island, and initially there's nothing on it, and then it gets colonized by plants and a few bugs and so on, and slowly an ecosystem builds up. And as a result, the first species that get there have lots of available resources that they can utilize, resources that back home on the mainland are used by other species that aren't, that aren't present. And so the idea is that with all these opportunities available, whatever species get there have the opportunity to speciate and diversify and to occupy these niches that they can't use on the mainland. And so that, that is the idea of ecological opportunity. And it's certainly a very plausible idea, but by the same token, it's an idea that's it's not very easy to test. And so what I would like to suggest today that one way that one might test an idea of the role of ecological op opportunity is to compare species or clades that are present both on islands and on mainlands to see what they're doing in the two, in the two places and see whether you can see whether islands have played, a large have played a large role in their diversification. Now, I think it'll be no surprise to you that what I'm gonna do today is talk about research that I and many other people, including some people in this room, have done on anolis lizards in the Caribbean. And so my goal today is to, to ask at first the question, is adaptive radiation an island phenomenon in anolis lizards? Now let me briefly introduce anoles. Anoles are known primarily by two characteristics. One is the presence of expanded toe pads, similar to what geckos have, and I'll talk more about them in a moment. The second trait is the presence of an ex extensible throat fan called a dewlap, possessed by almost all males in the genus, and in some cases by females. And for those of you not familiar with anoles, I just thought I'd let you see what the typical day of a male anole is like. This is a anole from Jamaica, and they spend all day long doing this. Just bobbing up and down and sticking out their dewlap. And basically what he's saying is, I'm here, this is my territory, if you're another male, go away. If you're a female, come here. And they spend their whole day doing that. They actually use their dewlaps in a variety of contexts. They also even display to predators. And it's also used in species recognition. And there's actually a great diversity of dewlap colors among species. It's a very interesting topic, what this diversity means, but something I won't, I won't get into today. So a little known secret among anole biologists that many of you may not be aware of because it's not, it's not talked about very much is that anoles don't occur just in the Caribbean. They also occur in Central and South America. And really there's not been a tremendous amount of research on the mainland anoles. And in fact, however, there are actually more species on the mainland than there are on the islands. Now in, at some level that's not surprising. It's of course a much greater area, but there are more species there. And so, as I said, my talk today, is, the question is going to be, is adaptive radiation an island phenomenon in anoles? And I'm gonna start the talk by reviewing what we know about the radiation of anoles in the West Indies. And I wanna apologize in advance. I know some of you in the room are quite familiar with the anole story, and this will all be review, and I, I hope it won't be too boring to you. I think some of you may not know, and so I'm gonna go over what I and many other people have discovered about West Indian anoles talking about these topics. Then in the second half of the talk, I'm gonna cover the same ground talking about the mainland anole radiations. And I wanna say at the outset that this, talking about the mainland anoles is very much a prospective talk. I'm talking about ideas that are just developing now of research that's very much in the early stages. And so you'll see it's very speculative in many respects. And I'm just throwing out ideas that we hope to collect data and test. And so be prepared, you're not gonna get great conclusions, just some ideas, and I'd really be interested in, in whatever feedback I might get from you guys. So let's go, let's get started. We'll start with the West Indian anoles. I'm gonna focus on the islands of the Greater Antilles. That is Cuba, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. And on these islands, there are two patterns of interest. First, on any one island, there are a great diversity of species that live in the same place, but in different parts of that environment. So for example, if you went to Puerto Rico and you went up into the Luquillo Mountains, into the rainforest, if you walked in the rainforest and sat down and were quiet, after a couple of minutes, the lizards would forget you were there and they would come out and start being active. And you would see that there are a whole bunch of species living in the same place, but occupying different parts of the habitat. There'd be one down on the tree trunk near the ground, another in the bushy areas, a couple up on top of the tree and on the twigs and so on. 
Moreover, these species are different morphologically in a way that seems to make sense. Long legs here, perhaps for running and jumping, short legs for creeping and crawling, big toe pads, and so on. And so they differ in where they live, in their morphology, and in their behavior in a way that sort of makes sense in a, an associated way. The most interesting thing, however, is if you go to any of the other islands, you see the same set of habitat specialists. Now, we call these habitat specialists ecomorphs. It's a bit of jargon that's used a lot, and uh, I try not to use it. But it basically means habitat specialist. And so, for example, if you went to Cuba or Hispaniola or Jamaica, you would see an animal that looked very much like the twig and ole, living in, on twigs and narrow surfaces and creeping very slowly. But it's not the same species, but it almost might as well be. It's so similar looking. And for the most part, that's true of each one of these sets of habitat specialists. They occur on each one of the islands. And so I just want to introduce them to you uh, briefly. And so we, we name them for the part of the environment where you normally find them. So the first type are the trunk ground anoles. These are species found on tree trunks or other broad surfaces near the ground. And they go down to the ground to forage and to fight with conspecifics and so on. Their most obvious feature are their extremely long hind limbs. They're very stocky, muscular animals with small, poorly developed toe pads, and they're brown in color. This is a species from Hispaniola. And here are the trunk ground anoles from the other islands. Next are the trunk crown anoles. These are species that are also found on the tree trunk, but from about eye level to the tops of the trees and up into the canopy and in, into the vegetation. They have shorter legs, they have a longer head, much better developed toe pads, and they can, off, they can also turn color from green to brown. And here are the trunk crown anoles from the four islands. Next are the crown giants. As their name implies, these are the giants of the animal world. They get maybe about that big. Um, they're, they're large, they have a large head, a vertebral crest running down their back. Most of them can change color from green to brown. These are also the most aggressive of the anole ecomorphs. They will stand their ground and defend themselves. They bite viciously hard. It's very dangerous work dealing with them. And here are the crown giants from the islands. Next are the grass bush anoles. These are slight little lizards found low to the ground on narrow vegetation. They're on bushes or sometimes even grass blades or ferns. They have short forelimbs. They're very slender with a long head. And their most interesting feature is that they have an extremely long tail, sometimes as much as four times the length of their body. And this is a, a character that's not well understood. And here are the grass bush anoles of several islands. Finally, the last type is the most extreme in many respects. I've already mentioned them, the twig anoles that use very narrow surfaces. They creep very slowly on these surfaces. They have short limbs and a tail, a long pointy head. A, they're light, cryptic in color. And here are the twig anoles of the four different islands. So you have these, these different habitat specialist types. And the first question we want to ask is, how did they evolve? How is it that we get the same type on every island? And at the extreme, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that each type has only evolved a single time and then has somehow made its way to the four different islands and become different species. Now, if that were the case, oh, so of course we need a, a phylogeny to ask that sort of question. And what I'm going to base my, my, my talk on today is this phylogeny. It's based on mitochondrial DNA. And it's a, a phylogeny that was, it's been a long running project. And I just want to give credit to the many people who have been involved in it. It started a long time ago, back when I was at Washington University in St. Louis. It was a collaboration with Alan Larson there. Todd Jackman was a postdoc at the time in the lab. And also Kevin DeCaros at the Smithsonian was involved. And then more recently, a number of people who came through our labs were involved in the project. The one you know the best is Rich Glore, a former postdoc here, but also Kirsten Nicholson and Jason Colby. Now, I should add that recently we have developed a phylogeny based on nuclear DNA. And to my de delight, it's exactly the same. In any, every important way, the nuclear phylogeny gives you the same pattern as the mitochondrial one. I'm not going to get into any of the details. I'd be happy to talk about phylogenetics if you want. But the bottom line is that we, we have this phylogeny that is the basis of what I'm about to tell you. And that is, how can we interpret the evolution of these habitat specialists? One possibility is that each type evolved a single time and then got to all four islands. Now, if that were the case, the twigginoles, say, on the four islands would be closely related to each other. You would see, to, see a clade of twigginoles with members of all four islands. And you'd have a clade of trunk ground anoles and trunk crown anoles and so on. The alternative hypothesis is that each one of these types has evolved independently on each island, in which case you would not find members of the same habitat specialist type on different islands being closely related. And in fact, that's what we find. So for example, here are the trunk crown anoles. And you can see the color represents the different islands. 
They occur on four very different parts of the tr very differently placed parts of the tree. They're clearly independently derived. And this is true of each one of these habitat specialist types. Here are the trunk ground anoles and the twig anoles and the grass bush anoles. Each of these types is, has, has evolved independently on each island. And so what we have is a phenomenon here of convergence, not only of particular habitat specialist types, but of entire assemblages that have evolved independently on each island. And this is a phenomenon that's talked about a lot in recent years, but there really aren't all that many well-documented examples of it. And I would argue this is one of the best examples of convergence of entire communities. Well, the next question is, why is it that we see these same habitat specialists evolving on each island? That is, in particular, why do they evolve the same, the same way to occupy the same part of the habitat? So convergent evolution has long been taken as ev evidence of evolutionary adaptation, particularly convergence of animals living in the same environmental conditions. So for example, we get these trunk crown anoles. They're all green. They all have big toe pads and relatively short legs. Why is it that living high up in the tree, using the branches and the vegetation, why is it that you evolve this particular suite of characteristics? Well, two features in particular in anoles have, have uh, been the focus of most study. And those are the toe pads and how long the legs are. So let me go through each one of them briefly. First, the toe pads. Anoles can cling really quite remarkably well. This is a brown anole from Cuba. And if you can see, there's a microscope slide here. It's hanging on by a single toe. So obviously, these toe pads give them great clinging capability. Well, just to take a closer look at what the, how the toe pads are constructed, they're expanded scales on the tips of the toes. And there are lots of these scales, which are called lamellae. Now, most notably, species differ in the composition of their, of their toe pads. You can see that this species has a much smaller toe pad than this one. And if you counted them up, it has many fewer scales, fewer lamellae. Now, this is a more terrestrial species. This is a more arboreal species. And it turns out, in general, there's a correlation that the more arboreal species have much better developed toe pads. So for example, here are the number of scales, the number of lamellae on the forefoot and the hind foot. And you can see the two very arboreal types, the trunk crown anole and the crown giants, have many more lamellae than the other types of anoles. And the same would be true if I showed you data on the size of their toe pads. So the toe pads correlate with habitat use. The second characteristic is the length of the hind limbs. This is a silhouette of the common species on, on Hispaniola. These are actual lizards that, uh, that Luke Mahler actually scanned and turned into an image. And what I want to point out is the difference in relative leg length, that is leg length compared to body size. At one extreme, we have the twig anoles here with very short legs. And at the other extreme, the much longer hind limbs of the trunk ground anole. And it turns out that leg length is correlated with where you find them, that there is a correlation between the diameter of the perch they're on, corrected for body size, and limb length. And you can see it's quite a strong correlation for the forelimb. And oh, there we go. And the, a bit messier for the hind limb, but still statistically significant. So again, there's a correlation between where, how long their limbs are and where you find on how broad the surface is they're using. Now, many studies of ecological morphology sort of end with documenting this correlation and maybe spinning a story about why they're related. But going back all the way to the 1980s, Steve Arnold and Ray Huey and others made an important point that if we want to understand the connection between morphology and ecology, and I should add Peter Wainwright also was very important in the development of this idea. If you want to understand this connection, you really not need to understand what the morphology does for the organism, and in turn, what those capabilities, how it allows it to interact with the environment in different ways. In other words, what do long legs or toe pads do in terms of how fast they run, how well they can cling, and in turn, how does that relate to where you find them in the environment? So to ask these sorts of questions, it's important to, to measure aspects of performance that are, e that are, on the one hand, ecologically relevant, that matter to the animals, but also that are not that difficult to measure, particularly if you're going to do this in the field. And so I and a number of colleagues have focused on three primary measures of performance. And those are how fast the lizards can run, how far they can jump, and how well they're able to cling to smooth surfaces. Now, running ability has obvious implications for a lizard in terms of escaping predators and capturing prey and so on. Jumping ability, the same, the same sort of importance. Clinging ability is important to lizards for recreational purposes. <laughs> so, how do we measure these things? 
Well, here's how, at least in the old days, we measured sprinting capability. We'd go into the field and we would take this portable lizard racetrack. And basically, this is a narrow uh, a trackway. You can hopefully see that there are plexiglass walls. And when we actually would run the lizards, we would put paper, brown paper over the walls, creating a kind of tunnel effect. And if all goes well, we'd put the lizard at the bottom, and it would go sprinting up to the top towards this black bag, which was a refuge. And as they did that, they would break this uh, infrared beam, and that would feed back into a computer, and that would tell us how fast the lizard could run. Now, increasingly these days, people just use a high-speed camera and do it and, and record them and measure it after the fact. But in the old days, we used the, the infrared sensors. Now, I should point out that um, those of you who have worked at, this was often done in field stations, would take our racetrack, would set it up. Those of you who have worked at field stations know that they're often wonderful places to do your research. They're out in remote, beautiful areas. There's all kinds of great biodiversity around you. And working in field stations is often just fantastic. But those of you who have been there also know that after a while, it can get a little slow. There's not a lot to do there besides your research. And so when we would show up with our racetrack, people actually thought that was pretty exciting. And say, wow, I want to come watch. And so we would actually get pretty big crowds. <laughs> All right, so that's lizard racing. The low-tech part of our, of our studies used to be measuring jumping ability. And so what we would do, this is a clipboard, and this is just some rough, rubbery surface, and this, of course, is a lizard. And so we would put the lizard on the clipboard. I would poke it right here, and if all went well, the lizard would jump, and we would take a tape measure and see how far it could jump. And, you know, it worked reasonably well. Now, in more recent years, some colleagues of mine, uh, particularly Anthony Harrell and Duncan Urshik, came up with a much better way of me measuring jumping ability. This is a force platform that can actually measure the amount of force that the lizard can generate as it launches itself. And combined with an analysis of the, the trajectory of the lizard, can get a much more accurate measure of their jumping capabilities. Clinging capabilities are measured now in the very same way. This is, again, a force platform. You put the lizard, it's, it's a uh, toe pads down on the, on the platform, you just gently pull it backwards and you can measure the forces that it can generate by its toe pads in opposition to being pulled and get a pretty precise measure of their clinging capabilities. This is one of these large ones again and Anthony is no dummy, he taped its mouth shut. <laughs> anyway, that's how we measure the performance of these animals and I don't, I'm not going to go through the results but I'm going to just summarize them, I'd be happy to talk about it later. The short story is that most of the predictions that we made turned out to be true. It turns out that lizards with longer legs can jump farther and can run faster. Lizards with biggest, bigger toe pads can actually cling better. Now, there were, for, there were a few interesting twists as well. We did learn some things we didn't expect. I'm not going to get into that. But the short, the short story is that we have a pretty good idea for these anoles how morphology translates into what they can do. Conversely, or in addition, we go out in the field, we watch where they are, we, watch, we film them and see what they're doing, and we have a pretty good idea of how they use these capabilities. Lizards that can run fast actually do use that ability, primarily to escape uh, simulated predator, predators. Lizards with, uh, with good clinging capability are found in habitats that are slick, that they need that ability. And so we, at this point in our research, we thought we had a pretty good idea of sort of how lizards are adapting to their environment. What is the adaptive significance of these traits and why they converge in particular habitats? Now, finally, the third question is, what, is the what are the ecological processes that drive this divergence? Why is it that species use different uh, habitats and then adapt to them? And the classic explanation for adaptive radiation Going back to, to George Gaylord Simpson and more recently Dolph Schluter's uh, wonderful book, I think the basic idea is that species interact with each other and have negative interactions, and as a result, they diverge in habitat use or resource use to get out of each other's way, and then they adapt to those resources. And so one prediction that this makes is that, in fact, species have negative interactions on each other. And so the question is, can we actually document that such negative interactions exist. And I'm going to show you two lines of evidence that suggest that they do. The first is the result of, um, of introduced species. Now, we all know that introduced species can be a big problem for men in many respects, but they're also a fortuitous opportunity because introductions in many respects can be quasi-experiments, the experiments we can't ethically conduct but they happen anyway, and we might as well take advantage of them. And so increasingly, ecologists and now evolutionary biologists are taking advantage of these opportunities. And so it turns out that animals have been introduced widely throughout the Caribbean and into Florida. And as a result, a, a while ago, 
uh, I and Tom and, and Jane Marks surveyed the introductions that had occurred in the Caribbean. And we basically, for each introduction, we recorded two things. First, was there already an ecologically similar species present where the species was introduced? And secondly, what was the outcome of the introduction? Was it a big success or, or not? So in 12 cases, a species was introduced into an area in which there was already an ecologically similar species present. And the outcome was very consistent. In no case was that introduction a success. Either the introduced population had gone extinct or was still very narrowly distributed at the point of introduction. Now by contrast, there were 11 cases in which a species was introduced into an area in which there was not a similar species already present. And I use as my poster lizard for, the, for this case, the, the brown, Cuban brown anole, Anolis sagrii, introduced into Florida probably more than a century ago, that if you've been to Florida, it's now everywhere. It's covered all of Florida, it's marching up into Georgia, and it's soon gonna be heading west across the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. A clear example of, in the absence of an ecologically similar species, how an introduced species can do very well. And it turns out that that's a, quite a common phenomenon. Many of these species introduced into an area in which there's not already an ecologically sp similar species do very well. Now this is actually, or this part of it is actually a, an example of what's called the priority effect in ecology. Basically the idea that if another species is already present, it's hard to become established. And I think it does strongly suggest that animal species interact strongly with each other. Now the second line of evidence has to, do, has to do with experimental manipulations, testing for interactions. And I'm just gonna give you one example. It's from a study that I was involved in years ago with uh, Manuel Leal, who kindly provided that video of me failing to catch a lizard, and, uh, and Javier Rodriguez Robles. And it occurred in Puerto Rico in the Lu Luquillo Mountains. And basically what we did was we removed this trunk ground species, this brown anole, Anolis gunlaki, and monitored the density of the green anole Anolis evermani. And so we went out into the forest and we established a plot about the size of this room. And from it, we removed all the adult male gunlaki. And we also had a control plot where we did not re remove them. And then we replicated this, uh, these two treatments three times. So three experimentals and three controls. We randomly chose which one, which plot got which treatment. And here are the results. The uh, y-axis is the number of green anoles. And at the start of the experiment, you can see they were about the same. Very quickly, there was a difference that when you remove the brown anole, the green anole density went up. A lot of fluctuation due to probably to weather. But you can see by the end of the experiment, there's a fourfold difference in the number of green anoles compared to the number, uh, uh, number of green anoles in the absence of brown anoles compared to where the brown anoles are present. Again, a strong suggestion that brown anoles have a negative effect on green anoles. Now, I should point out that this example is just one of many studies that have looked at interactions of anoles, and there have been studies of all different sorts. And those studies have, for the most part, come to the same general conclusion, that there are strong interspecific interactions. And this goes back to the 1970s, and in fact, it goes back to the work of Tom Shainer and others, such as Jonathan Roughgarden, where anoles were really the, the workhorse of community ecology theory and experimentation at that time and a huge body of work, experimental, observational, behavioral, it all indicates, almost without exception, that anoles have negative interactions. Well, I've got Tom up here. I also want to acknowledge just a gratuitous shout out to Dave Spiller. Um, Dave, Tom, and I have worked in the Bahamas for a long time, and I decided not to talk about that today because I figure you guys have heard plenty about that already, but it's been a real pleasure to work with these guys doing experimental work on the Bahamas. In any case, the last question is, how do these anoles interact ecologically? I've tried to be careful in my wording and not specify what the interaction is, but for a large number of reasons, it's most likely that in most cases, the interaction is competition for resources. These spe species are for the most part generalist insectivores. They eat more or less the same things. And for a lot of reasons, it's most likely that the negative interaction is due to resource competition, probably primarily for food. I'd be happy to talk more about that later. However, as many of you know, in the last several decades, the role of predation as a factor structuring communities has become increasingly important. And the question one might ask is, is there a role for predation among anoles, of one anole on another, in structuring communities? And this question really has not been investigated. But there are two reasons to suggest that predation in some cases might be important. 
first is that some and all species are much larger than others. These are the two, this is the largest and smallest species in Cuba. These are both adult males. There is no doubt that this guy will eat this one. In fact, he will eat lizards a lot larger than this one. So no doubt that predation can be important there. Secondly, as you probably are aware, lizards being reptiles start out much smaller than they end up. And that means that this can happen. Even when adults are the same size in different species, they can eat the babies of the other species. And this occurs as well. And so it's an open question how much, what, how important one animal eating another is in structuring communities. Moreover, Dolph Schluter, in his fabulous 2000 book, The Ecology of Adaptive Radiation, which I highly recommend, the book is full of interesting novel ideas. One of those ideas was he pointed out that many of the classic adaptive radiations we talk about involve species that are now on multiple trophic levels, with one eating another. And so his point was that maybe Adaptive radiation is driven not only by competition, but maybe predation plays a role in driving adaptive radiation as well. Now, as far as I'm aware, this idea has never really been tested. And I think it would be an excellent, I think a Knowles would be an excellent group in which to test this idea. And so for those of you graduate students who are looking for something, you're sick of what you're doing, this is the topic for you. I think there's a great study to be done and it's, it just hasn't been looked at. Well, having said that, I now want to switch over and start talking about the mainland anoles. Remember, this is going to be very prospective. As you'll see, this is work that is just now in progress. So a reminder that there are more species of anoles on the mainland than in the Caribbean. And the first thing is to look at the phylogeny of the mainland anoles. And it turns out that the mainland anoles sort out very nicely. At the very base of the anole tree, there is one clade that actually there are about 75 species here, although we only represented a few of them in this study. But there's a basal mainland clade. Now, it's very clear that the, uh, that the closest relative of anoles occurred somewhere in Central or South America. So this is the ancestral condition, being on the mainland. Then, at the base of the tree, a clade colonized the Caribbean and diversified very widely. And then, very clearly, a clade of Caribbean anoles came back to the mainland and diversified. It's very clear that this is a mainland, a island to mainland recolonization. We used to think that that wasn't possible, that they, you know, once you get into the island, you become too soft and you can't compete in the, on the mainland. People did say things like that, but now there are increasingly examples of this sort of thing. Phylogenies have revealed this, and sometimes these bat colonizations have actually diversified widely, and this certainly is one example. Interestingly enough, there are about 150 species in this clade compared to 75 species in the older clade. So what about the morphological diversity of these clades? Well, this is a comparison of mainland and island anoles. This is a principal components analysis on just some of the same characters I've talked about before. Size has been removed from these characters. And you can see at first pass that, as a rough approximation, the amount of morphospace occupied by mainland anoles is roughly on the same order as the Caribbean radiation. And even if you take out this one outlier species, it's still more or less the same amount of morphological diversity. So mainland and Caribbean anoles, roughly approximately the same morphological diversity. I, and if I were to show you ecological diversity, you'd see the same thing. The mainland anoles are very diverse ecologically roughly on the same order as the, of diversity as the Caribbean anoles. Now, I do want to point out that this was a paper that uh, Gabriel Pinto was the first author, but the second author was your very own Luke Mahler, shown here staring at an egg. And um, Luke really deserves credit for many reasons. He should have been the first author on this paper. It was actually a, an excellent paper in Proceedings of the Royal Society, and I like to highlight it because he kind of got buried in the et al., but he really was the, the force behind this paper, and it's a really cool paper. And, he deserves the credit. Anyway, when we look at the phylogeny of the anoles again, we find that there's an interesting pattern. Remember that the mainland anoles, two clades, the basal clade here and the derived Caribbean clade, what we see is that here are the basal mainland anoles. Then when they colonize the Caribbean, the, the Caribbean anoles only overlap partially, that they occupy a space up here that the basal clade didn't occupy. And by the same token, the Caribbean anoles abandon this part of morphological space. Then, from within the Caribbean clade, the second mainland clade evolves, and it moves back to where the first mainland clade was. It, it again abandons this area and this one, and it comes back down here. And so 
of course, with a three clade comparison, you really can't say anything statistical, but I think it is striking how much these two mainland clades overlap with each other and differ from the Caribbean radiation. All right, at this point, I have an interim summary of my talk. Don't get excited, I'm not done yet. But I would conclude that anolis adaptive radiation is not an island phenomenon. And I say that because, um, well, oops, because the mainland anoles are just as diverse as the Caribbean anoles in, morpho in morphological diversity and ecological diversity and so on. And so it's not an island phenomenon. As a result, I would argue that this idea of ecological opportunity or empty niches or whatever you want to call it would not seem to be responsible for adaptive radiation in anoles unless you want to postulate that they had equal opportunity on the mainland, which doesn't seem plausible. Um, so what then is responsible for anole adaptive radiation? Well, I'd like to invoke the old idea of a key innovation, and particularly the evolution of the toe pads, which I would suggest to you has allowed anoles to utilize the environment in ways not possible for other lizard groups. They've been able to go up into the in arboreal habitats and use all kinds of ways uh, habitats in ways not previously possible, and maybe that has triggered adaptive radiation in both the mainland and the islands. Now, the idea of key innovations has actually come in for a lot of abuse in recent years, and because, well, people don't like it because it's, it's just storytelling. And you know what? It is. I can't tell, it's a story and that's all I can say, so I'm just gonna throw it out and move on. And so I wanna move on to the topic of ecological morphology, and what is it that we know about the mainland anoles? And the first question that you might have is, do the, the West Indian ecomorphs, the habitat specialists, exist on the mainland? And in some cases, they do. For example, there are some twig anoles. Here are two mainland twig anoles. Morphologically, they're very similar to the Caribbean ones. They use narrow surfaces. They creep slowly. They're basically twig anoles. There is one grass bush anole. This species from Panama and Venezuela is a dead ringer for the West Indian grass bush anoles. And there may be even a few, trunk, uh, a few crown giants. So there are a few mainland anoles that fit the Caribbean ecomorphs. However, most mainland species do not fit into the West Indian ecomorph ideas. For example, here is some data from a paper from Duncan Urshik a while ago. And this is showing, again, morphological uh, data on a principal components analysis. This is PC1 versus PC2, 3, and 4. The polygons are where the ecomorphs fall in morphological space, and the circles are mainland species. And you can see most of the mainland species do not fall within the ecomorph morphological space. They are morphologically distinctive. And in fact, as we are collecting more data, this continues to be the pattern. Most mainland species do not correspond to the West Indian ecomorphs. Now let me just give you a few examples. For example, those of you who have been to La Selva, the OTS field station that's so famous, these are the common species at La Selva, and none of them has a counterpart in the West Indies. This is a little sprightly guy that jumps among the, bit, the bushes and low twigs. Nothing like, none of the ecomorphs are like that. Here is a terrestrial species that lives in the leaf litter, which you don't see in the ecomorphs. A large lizard found low down on logs, and one that, that lives near streams and jumps into the streams to escape predators. These are unlike any of the anole ecomorphs. And in fact, just to show you a few more of my favorite mainland species, this is a, this is a species Anolis gorgone. Uh, I just like it because it's so beautiful. Luke Mahler got to see it, and someday I hope to see it. But it's a very sprightly animal with very long, thin legs. Here is another leaf litter, dweller, leaf litter dwelling lizard. This is from the Amazon, Anolis nitens. And finally, the only beach anole that exists. Everyone thinks to go to the Caribbean and hang out on the beach, but they, the anoles don't live on the beach. But there is one in Venezuela that does. So the point is that most mainland anoles do not correspond to the West Indian ecomorphs. Now you might ask, do, is there a syndrome of, of mainland, a different syndrome of ecomorphs that has evolved repeatedly across the mainland? And we actually don't know the answer to that for, for two reasons. The biggest reason is that the phylogeny for the mainland anoles hasn't resolved itself yet. And obviously we need a phylogeny to document convergent evolution. And hopefully that will be in place soon. Moreover, we're still in the process of collecting morphological and ecological data. However, there is at least one case of, of convergence of a type. We can tell that from what we do know about the, uh, about the 
phylogeny, and that has to do with these semi-aquatic anoles that live near the water and jump into the water to escape predators. And it's very clear that there are these types that are morphologically and ecologically very similar that have evolved at least three times, and there are probably two other independent derivations that we can't yet place in the phylogeny, but pretty clearly are not sister taxa to the ones here. So at least one ecomorph exists in the mainland, and it's an open question where, whether there are more, and of course that will be very interesting to find out. Now, a more general question. Is there a relationship between morphology and ecology? Is, is, the, is the relationship the same between in the mainland as it is in the islands? And in fact, already our preliminary data, or in this case old data, suggests that there are very different relationships. Look, for example, at the relationship between forelimb length and perch diameter. Very strong in the Caribbean, much less strong in the mainland. Or between forelimb and perch height, very strongly negative here, no relationship. So, so there are big differences in that relationship between morphology and ecology. And I want to give you one graphic example, and that is the relationship between perch diameter and toe pad area. And what you can see is that for a given perch diameter, the Caribbean anoles have bigger toe pads. Now, why would a Caribbean anole need bigger toe pads? There's basically two possible explanations. One explanation is that Caribbean toe pads are inferior in clinging ability to mainland toe pads, that they need the same amount of clinging ability, but if they have inferior toe pads, they would need bigger toe pads to produce the same amount of clinging ability, and that would produce this relationship. This seems unlikely. I mean, a toe pad would seem to be a toe pad, but it is certainly possi uh, possible that there's a difference in this part of the relationship. The other possibility is that, for some reason, Caribbean anoles need more clinging ability to use the same habitat. Now, why, what would cause them to need more clinging ability? Well, you can think of all kinds of possible explanations, and I don't have an answer, but I just want to show, throw out one possibility. Caribbean anoles are much more territorial. They get in fights a lot more, and it might mean that they might fight with each other and try to throw each other off, and they need to cling better. Now, I've been suggesting this possibility for a while, but recently somebody sent me this photograph. These are two anoles fighting, and you can see this guy is holding up both of them just by its hind legs. Well, I thought that was a pretty cool photo, but pretty soon after that, I got two more photos of the same thing. Apparently, this happens all the time. They get into fights, and they have to hold not only their own weight, but the other ones as well. So maybe they're really, maybe some aspect of their biology requires greater clinging capability to live in the same place. Well, overall, my prediction, and this is very much work to be, questions to be resolved, is that this is the difference, that there are different selective demands in the mainland and the islands, and that they require different functional capabilities, and that's why we see these different morphology to ecology relationships that we, we think that we, we know the, how morphology translates into function. It's how function translates into ecology and behavior that is likely to be the difference. That's my idea going into this. Nonetheless, to our surprise, we found out that there are differences in the morphology to performance relationship that were really completely unexpected. So, for example, the relationship between hind limb length and how fast a lizard runs, for a given hind limb length, Caribbean lizards are faster. Now, this to us was a shock because we basically thought that hind limb length was the whole story, and yet clearly it's not. And so we have to go back into the, into the biomechanics lab to figure out what is responsible for this. And the short story is we're thinking maybe there are differences in the muscles and in the power output or how fast they fire or something like that that hadn't been studied that might differentiate the Caribbean from mainland anoles. But as I said, this is completely surprising. Something I haven't talked about, the relationship between head height and bite force. Again, there's a difference. For a given head height, mainland anoles can bite harder. Again, this was unexpected, and, and we thought we knew what was going on in terms of the determinants of bite force. Obviously, there's more going on than we thought. So, to some extent, the difference between uh, the morphology-ecology difference may have to do with differences in how morphology translates into performance, but my bet is still that most of it is that the species have different ecological requirements selecting for different performance capabilities. And so the final, the final part I want to talk about here is what are the ecological processes that might have different selective demands in terms of function? And 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago, Robin Andrews compared what was known 
about the population biology of mainland and Caribbean anoles. And she came up with the following differences. So mainland anoles, compared to Caribbean ones, tend to have lower densities. This is a survey of all the studies that have been done at that time. They survive less. Often they only survive for a year. They eat more. They forage less. They eat better stuff. And they grow faster. These are all attributes of mainland anoles. Now I can tell you that all of these findings hold to this day. And the reason they hold is that no one has collected any more data. <laughs> and it's a real shame because we really need to know more about the population biology of many species, but people will stop doing it. And hopefully more data will be collected soon. In any case, what could cause these differences? Well, one possibility is that there are more competitors on the mainland, more other types of competitors. And certainly there are. There are many other types of arboreal lizards. There are lots more insectivorous birds. There's even a bunch of frogs and there are other things. So there certainly are lots of other things that might be competing with the knolls. Nonetheless, competition is not, really doesn't explain these differences for the simple reason that it, if there are more competitors, they shouldn't be eating more food. They should be eating less. They should be spending more time foraging, eating worse stuff, and growing slower. So competition really doesn't seem to explain these patterns. Another possibility, however, is that there are more predators on the mainland. And that is consistent with these possibilities, because more predators would mean lower survivorship, which in turn would mean lower density, and that would allow more food to be eaten by the survivors. And so predation could account the higher predation in the mainland could account for these differences. Now, are there more predators? I mean, of course there are. There are tons of different birds in the mainland, many more that will eat anoles, including species that aren't really supposed to do that. This is a quetzal, which is a fruit eater. But what's it got in its mouth? An anole. Everyone will eat an anole in the mainland. There are lots of snakes. Monkeys eat them, peccaries. You name it, they love to eat anoles. So there are many types of predators in the mainland, many more in the islands. And I postulate that differences in predation are responsible for those differences in population biology. Well, what consequences would greater predation have for mainland adaptation, uh, our, our selective environments? And I think that there's a big difference, that on the mainland, anoles tend to be warier. They are very cryptic. They don't move around a lot. I think that they're just scared to death all the time. And so they're very quiescent. Whereas those of you who have been to the Caribbean, the anoles go, they couldn't care less if you're standing right next to them. They're displaying, they're fighting with each other, they're running around. And so what I would suggest, and this is of course very speculative, is that what I like to say is that two lizards living on the same surface, the same place, but one on the islands and one on the mainland, must adapt in very different ways. Because on the islands, they're worried about competing with their conspecifics, where in the mainland, they're worried about predation. And I would argue that has selected for different performance capabilities and thus has driven evolutionary diversification in very different ways. Now, as I said, this is just a, an idea that we're now beginning to collect data for. It's not, and um, right now, we're in the natural history phase of just learning about the different species, seeing where they live and what they do. The next question is the harder one. How do we test the hypothesis that differences in predation have driven diversification in different ways, and I have a few ideas, but I'd certainly be interested in any thoughts anyone might have. Well, in almost conclusion, uh, mainland anoles are as diverse as island anoles, but they've radiated in very different ways. Predation seems to be more important and competition less important in the mainland. But I do want to emphasize that there are many more questions than answers, and that, in fact, there are plenty of research opportunities. I love to say there are more than enough anoles to go around. And so really, if you're looking for a project, think about anoles. They're really great for many different things. Now, normally I would end here, but I'm going to, I'm going to abuse your hospitality by just talking for a couple minutes about one last thing. And that is going to the main, to work in the mainland is letting me go to new places and see all kinds of cool new things. And I'm really just having a blast but after 20 years in the Caribbean to get to go to see new animals and cool places. And I just want to tell you about a trip that I took along with Luke Mahler two years ago to Ecuador. And it was to go to look for this lizard here, Anolis proboscis. And there's what I think is a great story. Proboscis was described in 1956. It was discovered in 1953. And over the next 13 years, six animals were collected, all of them males. All The point is it's got this long thing on its nose, this proboscis or horn or whatever. It's found from a little place in Ecuador called Mindo at about 4,000 feet. So six animals, all males with a horn. And then after 1966, nothing. For 40 years, this species was not seen. 
and many people began to believe that maybe it had gone extinct. And then in 2005, a bunch of bird watchers, of all people, <laughs> came across one walking across the road. They were in their minivan on an eco tour, and here's the arboreal lizard crossing the road, question why it was doing that, but they got out of their minivan, they took a picture, it's not clear that they knew what they had, but the picture got on the internet, and, um, and it, it became, somehow we, got, we became aware of it, that Anolis proboscis still lives. And so uh, my colleague Steve Poe at the University of New Mexico, who's great at finding hard to find anoles, went down to find it. And in fact, he found that, he, it turns out if you go out at night looking for anoles, you can find them. And he found they're, they're doing quite fine in this very narrow area. Now notice that this animal is um, the seventh male in a row. So that leads to the question, of course, what does the female look like? And Poe answered that question, but I put it to all of you. Does the female Anolis proboscis have a horn? And so I'm going to put it to a vote. Who thinks the female has a horn? Raise your hands. No one? <laughs> There's one vote? No one? Are, so everyone thinks that the female does not have a horn, yes? A lot of you are chickens, but <laughs> be that as it is, the answer we now know is that female Anolis proboscis do not have a horn. <laughs> it is sexually dimorphic. And so, of course, that leads to the suggestion that the horn has something to do with sexual selection. But Poe went out and found them at night, so all he could tell us is where they sleep. And so once we knew they were there and could be found, Luke and I and others went down to try to find them during the day to see what they're doing both for two reasons. One is it kind of looks like a twiganole. And so the question, is this a twiganole in habitat and behavior and so on? But also see if we could figure out what's going on with the horn. So, Number one, we found out why no one had seen them. They're really cryptic. They're high up in the trees. They're in really thick vegetation. It's almost impossible to find them. And so we had to actually go out at night, find them, and wait for them to wake up in the morning. Well, <laughs> it turns out that the even on the equator at 4,000 feet, it's really cold. And uh, anyway, it was hard work, but we, we did get a lot of data on them. They are twiganoles. There's no doubt about it. They move very slowly. They use very narrow surfaces. Take off the horn. They're a classic twiganole. But what about the horn? Well, we didn't see any encounters, either male-male or male-female, so we really don't know for sure, but we got a couple of hints. And the first one, I'm gonna show you this little video and watch what this guy does when he hits the, uh, he's gonna hit a leaf and watch his horn very carefully. So I should say, I had pictured these guys having sword fights with each other, the males, you know, <laughs> going like that. But watch what happens here. You see that? The horn just bent right over. Let me just play it one more time. As it hits the leaf, it bends over. These things are completely unstiff. Uh, we put them in plastic bags and hit the end of the plastic big bag and it would curl right over. So they're clearly not fighting with these things. So that was one clue. The other thing is that there were some sad males that had these droopy horns. <laughs> and look at this guy, he's such a sad sack. And we just felt that the poor guy's a loser, but these things happen. Um, but then we, we had one animal and we decided to feed it to see what would happen. And so let me get the video up of this. So this is, we just placed him on this branch and we went out and caught a grasshopper. And the grasshopper will show up in a second. Watch his horn right before he eats. So you can see the horn right now is pretty horizontal. And he orients. And right there, watch his horn lifts right up. You can see it. Pardon? It's out of the way, but they can move them. That's the point that they're not supposed to be able to do that. All my lizard anatomist friends were shocked that they can move their horn because there should not be any muscles on the tip of their nose. And so how do they do it? Well, maybe it's some sort of, maybe you can think of an analogy or something with hydrostatics, we don't know. And so we're gonna have to look at that, but this was a complete shock to, to all of our friends. Well, unfortunately, that's, that's all we found out about them. Our colleagues in, in keto have some in the lab and hopefully they will see more you know captive captive interactions but i just wanted to show you that because it's just so much fun this is an animal we had no idea what it was like and to go out and find him and observe him and it, there's just such a great diversity that if nothing else i'm having a ball checking out all these mainland anoles so with that i'll leave it with a picture of my favorite anoles and thank you for the invitation here it's been a real honor and thank you for your attention I would be happy to answer questions if anyone has any.
Yes. You would, the answer is, well, how you, conspicuous is kind of a loaded question, but one thing for certain is that they have enormous dewlaps. Some of them are just humongous. And moreover, the females in the Caribbean females either don't, have, in most species, either don't have a dewlap or have a little tiny one. In the Caribbean, the females have dewlaps sometimes as big as the males, sometimes enormous. And sometimes there's dimorphism in the dewlap color or pattern between the sexes. So that's not quite answering your question, but um, they have some of them enormous dewlaps. They don't seem to display that much, but when they do display, they seem pretty, pretty visible. Some people have suggested that many uh, mainland anoles have cryptic back patterns, such as this one up here is a mainland anole, and I think that's probably the case, although it's something that's not easy to quantify. Yes, Annie. Do you see any evidence of, of um, partitioning when you go and, if you were to go and like sample in an area the size of an island on the mainland? Do you see like more species, fewer species, and do you see them distributed in terms of the They are distributed. They're, I would say that they are equally as distributed as on the Caribbean. There's some high up in the trees, there's some down on the ground, some on the periphery. So they are quite, they are in different places. Caribbean communities maybe on average have more species, but there are certainly some sites in the mainland where you can find 10 or 11 species, which is as many as you can find on, on the islands. So it seems, we, we, we've got the data, we haven't really quantified it yet, but it's not obvious to me that there's any difference in sort of ecological breadth in communities. Some do, uh, some do and some don't. Of course, there's a difference in scale. There are species in the Caribbean that are island-wide, but those islands aren't that big. So um, there's, there's very, not obviously, I mean, there's variation in that. Yes? So back to the islands and the fact that they have, you know, intra-guild predation and, and size and age structuring. Uh, what do the different ecomorphs do when they're small? Do they go through a very different sort of ontogeny of, of uh, you know, where do they live and how is their morphology built for that? Or are they well, all kind of similar when they're real small? They are, they are different. I mean, you can tell the differences in the, the little babies. Um, to the, perhaps not quite as exaggerated, but they are different. In general, most species, the, the little guys have shifted down, but they're not all in the same place. So there are some differences. But overall, the babies haven't been, I mean, that's a really good question, and I think there's plenty of room to get a lot better data than what I'm basing my opinions on. The, the babies have been ignored to a large extent. But, but there is a, there's someone who's been working with me in Arhat Abzanov looking at allometry, and you know, most of the, the differences are present, Barry. You can tell them apart as babies. Peter. Um, by any chance, have you compared the rates of morphological diversification in the mainland and island Caribbean guys? So, taking your result, your idea of predation versus competition as, at face value as a test of whether predation drives faster diversification than competition. We have not really done that. Have you done that, Luke? We, it's a, we, the phylogeny, for one thing, hasn't come together yet. And at this point, I'm blaming unnamed people who said they would get the mainland phylogeny done and haven't. Um, we need that phylogeny, and hopefully it will come soon. That's the big impediment, and, and we're still sampling them. Uh, but one interesting question is there are these two mainland clades, the really old, deep one and the younger one, and will there be differences in those clades as well? And that's another question we'd really like to get at. But right now, I don't have the answer. Yes. Uh, related question. So, do you have do you have like fossils, anything to calibrate these divergence times the, between the islands or between There is one place where there are fossils from the Dominican Republic. The the place in Jurassic Park where they got their fossils. It really exists, but it's not Cretaceous. It's about 20 million years, and there are now 30 some fossils from there. But it's not clear that that really helps because it's too, it's not young enough, and so it's not clear that the fossils really help us because the, these are really deep splits and based on molecular dating, it's, the whole clade probably goes back 40 or 60 million years. And so unfortunately, the calibration doesn't really help all that much. What's your multiple load size? Even if you have fairly distant calibrations, you know, you might be able to say something. 
Uh, uh, the one thing I should add is that it appears from what we, where we think these fossils go that they probably go in very deep branches. And that, that's part of the problem is that that branch probably is well older than the fossils. But maybe. I mean, we're actually trying to work with these fossils now. We're even trying to extract DNA from a couple of them, which is a long shot. But if it worked, it would be fantastic. Okay. So the, you, you mentioned the key innovation of better developed towpads. And when you showed that sort of uh, two-dimensional sort of uh, PC space, uh, mainland ancestral to island, back to mainland, it was the towpads that got bigger. But then they went back smaller again with the derived uh, mainland species. And then you've got predation risk as an idea. Do these pieces all fit together in a story nicely, or? I'll leave that to you. No. Um, <laughs> well, it's, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. You would, I don't really understand why they have smaller toe pads unless, well. Innovation. It actually <coughs> well, I see what you're, I see what you're saying. Um, but there is variation. Though well, you're right. The biggest toe pads are on, on the islands. And I'm just not actually all that, I think we need a, a better understand, and this is one of the things we want to want to try to figure out, is what actually the predation, is. so let me sidestep the question away by saying years ago I talked to Gordon Oriens, the famous ornithologist, and I explained about the more predators in the mainland. I said, well, Caribbean, uh, mainland anoles must just be better at escaping because they're going to be faster and more nimble because they're all those predators. And he basically said, no. You've got all these predatory birds. If they see an anole in the open, that anole's dead. They're not escaping it. It's not their escaping ability. It's being cryptic and not being in exposed places. And it may have nothing to do with their, you know, their, how fast they are. And so I think what we really need is a better understanding of, of how, what they're doing to avoid being preyed upon. And I don't have a good idea yet. I mean, we're trying to observe them to get hints. But I, I mean, I'd be interested to see your thoughts on that. How much of that variation has radiated since the movement between mainland and island versus how much of it is ancestral, right? Because you put it in terms of it's lost this space. But maybe that was, it, could that space have been gained since the clay division? Well, so I mean, you're right that my wording was a little imprecise because when they came back to the mainland, that was one species. So there was no variation. It's one species that then diversified. And so, uh, so it's all the result of that diversification where it filled up since then. And so, uh, you know, it's all post-colonization, but it, yeah, so they, di they didn't go back up there and they moved back down. Oh, one last question. Island comparison, we instructed to separate the two uh, mainland clays, you know, keep the basal clay separate from the derivative clay as you do those comparisons, right? Because it might be distinct. Well, I, I think that's really fascinating, and it's something that I don't have an answer, but it's really interesting. The older clay, I mentioned that it only has half the species diversity of the younger clay. That's kind of curious. Moreover, the older clay is from the bottom of, of, of the distribution in South America, only up to sort of Panama and barely into Costa Rica whereas the younger clade covers all that ground and then goes all the way up to Mexico. So this younger clade is, in any sense you want to, in terms of numbers or range, is much more diverse. Now the question is, are they partitioning amongst themselves ecologically and morphologically? And then north of Costa Rica, do the, does the derived clade fill in where the other clade occupies lower down? I, I think that's going to be really fascinating. and I don't really have an answer yet. Let's thank Jonathan again for a great